Good evening, everyone. I'm Ed Remus, the Social Sciences Librarian at Northeastern Illinois University. On behalf of the NEIU Libraries, I'd like to welcome you all to this discussion. This event is taking place as part of an ongoing NEIU Libraries panel discussion series titled Between Past and Future that is co-sponsored by the NEIU History Department and the NEIU Political Science Department. Discussions in this series feature scholars with differing interpretations of controversial topics at the intersection of history and politics. Discussions in this series likewise feature scholars with diverse intellectual frameworks and varied areas of expertise. These discussions encourage scholars to clarify sites of divergent interpretations as well as sites of convergent interpretations for the benefit of future teaching, learning, research, and scholarship. This evening's event is made possible thanks to the research and planning efforts of our moderator, Crystalline Ortiz. Crystalline is a master's student of history at Northeastern Illinois University, and she is also the founder and president of the NEIU History Club. I would encourage any of you interested in History Club to contact Crystalline to learn more about their activities. Thank you very much, Crystalline, for bringing us together this evening. Thank you, Ed. Um, okay, so in 2022, the U.S. House of Representatives passed the Puerto Rico Status Act that would allow the people of Puerto Rico to vote to determine the island's political status. Um, should Puerto Rico remain a territory of the United States? Should it become a U.S. state? Or should Puerto Rico become an independent country? Our speakers for this evening have been asked to consider these questions, as well as some related ones such as which of these three alternatives would most benefit Puerto Ricans and how much or how little will the island's political status determine its fate and in what ways. The four scholars we have gathered here this evening bring distinct and sometimes differing perspectives on these issues. Our first speaker, Professor Hennaro Abraham, teaches political science at Gonzaga University. Professor Abraham will argue that Puerto Rico's only path forward towards a more sustainable and equitable future is independence. Our second speaker, Professor Harry Frankie Rivera, uh, teaches history at Bloomfield College. Professor Frankie Rivera will argue that Puerto Rico can only decolonize politically in two ways, by voting for independence or by voting for statehood. He'll argue that all other options besides not being viable or acceptable within the political framework of the United States are just rehashings of autonomic formulas or like the people in Puerto Rico like to say, quote unquote, light colonialism. Our third speaker, Professor Jorge Duwani, teaches anthropology at Florida International University. Professor Duwani will argue that each of the three main status alternatives, statehood, independence, or autonomy, has major advantages and disadvantages but a sovereign form of free association with the United States may be worthy of consideration as a non-colonial option for the people of Puerto Rico. Our fourth and final speaker, Professor Ian J. Seda Irizarry, teaches economics at the City University of New York. Professor Seda Irizarry will argue that the solving of Puerto Rico's colonial situation is a necessary but not sufficient condition to solve the problems of the victims of the ongoing socioeconomic crisis. I've asked each of these panelists to give opening remarks for about 12 minutes each. After this, each panelist will take a few minutes to respond to any points raised by their fellow panelists. Then for the remainder of the event, Ed Remus will moderate questions from the audience. We want to end the event no later than 8.30 p.m. So I'll ask our panelists to, bring, to give a brief closing remark by 8.15 at the latest. Now we'll hear from our first speaker, Dr. Hinato Abraham. Dr. Abraham is an assistant professor of political science at Gonzaga University in Washington State. His research focuses primarily on social movements, contentious politics and insurgencies in Latin America and the Caribbean, US foreign policy towards Latin America and their historical repercussions for human security, development and peace. He has conducted extensive field work in Colombia and has and currently endeavors research on Colombia and Venezuela in the context of the armed conflict that both countries endure and on Puerto Rico as a colony under US imperial rule. In addition to his research activities, Professor Abraham currently elaborates with Puericos Unidos and La Diaspora, a national advocacy organization, organization excuse me, uh, for Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans and serves as the vice president of the Puerto Rican Independence Party in the diaspora. Thank you for being with us here today, Professor Abraham. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's 
a little daunting task to be the first speaker, but I'll go ahead and start. Um, so hello everyone, thank you uh, for organizing this. Thank you, Ed and uh, Cristaline for, for all the work you put into this. I'd like to thank all the organizers at uh, Northeastern Illinois University for putting together the panel and the panelists for, for coming and agreeing to speak. Um, I'm always grateful to be given the opportunity to speak about Puerto Rico's colonial ills. It, there are issues that I care deeply about and I'm sure panelists agree with me as well. Um, I'd like to begin my opening remarks by just stating my position on the three questions posed. Concerning the first two questions, I believe that the only democratic and economically sustainable path forward for Puerto Rico is for it to become an independent nation, one that is free from the structures, institutions, and eventually the vestiges of colonialism. Puerto Rico is often seen as an anomaly in an essentially sovereign world, and that its political status, a colonial arrangement imposed by the U.S. Congress that keeps Puerto Rico as an object of exploitation for U.S. corporate conglomerates, is treated by political hacks that defend the status quo as an accident of history, or as a series of unintended consequences that have hardened into political custom. They entail interests that subsets of the American empire benefit from. This arrangement has ultimately undermined Puerto Rico's ability to sustain itself in the service of national interests. Acquired by the U.S. in 1898, by right of the Spanish-American War, Puerto Rico's economy was molded to fit the extractive interests and logics of the United States, whether it be through the sugar industry, which lasted from the 1900s to the 1930s uh, predominantly, a series of light industrial initiatives that lasted from the 30s to the 70s, tax exemptions reserved for intellectual property um, in the 1970s to the 2000s, or more recently, tax exemptions um, afforded to high net worth individuals via Act 2020-22, which has happened from 2012 to the present. Puerto Rico's ability to develop an effective tax, an effective tax regime when basic government services has been compromised. All while the corporate conglomerates take at least twice as much surplus value from the nation than what is invested in social services by federal government year. Um, the colonial state's historical response to these inadequate funds has been uh, coupled with the prohibitive import, import costs uh, imposed by a U.S. shipping monopoly has been to indulge in unsustainable bond emissions, a reality that's resulted in a $73 million public debt that's recently being restructured to the detriment of Puerto Rico. As debt has quickly accrued and tax revenue remained insufficient, operational funds for public services suffered, resulting in massive layoffs in the 2000s. These issues further perpetuated a long-standing brain drain, which continues to shrink the archipelago's tax base in the present. And as the nation's ability to invest in basic infrastructure has dwindled, uh, so has its ability to respond and rebuild after hurricanes. For this debt crisis, and this is uh, the, the panorama more people probably know on this pan in, in uh, the list of attendees, of the U.S. Congress, Puerto Rico's ultimate legal authority responded by imposing fiscal oversight board to ensure debt repayment. Uh, however, rather than helping the nation prosper, the con congressionally appointed board decided to withhold necessary funds to education, essential government services, and even disaster recovery funds after Hurricane Irma and Maria, uh, Maria had hit, all while privatizing the nation's electrical grid, uh, thus complicating the nation's sustainability even further. Further evidencing the imperialist intimacies forged between the federal government, the U.S. executive branch, and colonial authorities in managing of the extractive economic interests lay the people who are appointed to the board. Uh, most of its members are either professional debt collectors that treat Puerto Rico's woes as if they were analogous to Detroit or to Detroit's, or some of Puerto Rico's banking elites that have benefited from Puerto, Puerto Rico's debt and subsequent restructuring. In this sense, Puerto Rico's seemingly anomalous nature reveals more about the brute reality of what colonialism looks like for much of the world's racialized hinterlands that are also subject to the nefarious and purposeful interests of empire. The interests that empires entertain are ultimately defined by what empires do. They extract and exploit nations until extractive institutions that empires and colonial cadres prop up are no longer lucrative, much less sustainable. It is then when empires abandon colonial subjects to the economically barren landscape that they created for the sole purpose of extraction that the wretched of the earth that are condemned to endure poverty and misery if, if too unbearable are compelled to participate in migratory trends that condemn the nation to its eventual co-optation co and erasure. For the description of the nation and similarities that our nation garners with much of the essentially sovereign world, they beg a question of conditionality, which is the third question of this panel. If Puerto Rico's woes are to some extent comparable to that of the other nations that are essentially sovereign, why would changes to its political status matter in the determination of its fate? To this, I say Puerto Rico's woes through comparison with much of the global south, or particularly sovereign nations within our geographical proximity, 
in Latin America reveal an anomalous trait that is worth underscoring. Our lack of sovereignty has constrained our ability to fight the onslaught of neoliberal implementation policies. Whether other countries have been able to halt the advancements in neoliberal policy, debt traps, austerity measures, and other woes that Puerto Rico experiences, Puerto Rico is not, as the imposition of these measures are reinforced by a colonial relationship we garner with the U.S. Congress. In this sense, the ability to change such woes leaves anti-colonial movements in Puerto Rico with much organizational work to consider than what other social movements and sovereign nations would have to. Consequently, repertoires of resistance to empire are much more complex in the colony, a reality that's forced anti-colonial, anti-neoliberal movements to build politics under the problematic assumptions of democracy in a colony, and with it, to lead people down an organizational path that do not necessarily provide Puerto Ricans with their desired outcomes. All of this has worked against the accurate portrayal of support for independence in Puerto Rico, as independentistas or supporters of independence are sometimes not compelled to participate in in consequential procedural democratic exercise. In this sense, the woes that burden Puerto Rico connect us much uh, connects us to much of the racialized hinterlands of the world, not because they are identical or even relatively similar to the ills that other countries have to face, but rather that the elements that define our differences reveal patterns of exploitation that govern U.S. imperial behavior under different circumstances. Before this reality, it would be an error to assume that all of Puerto Rico's ills would be resolved through independence, as our ability to leverage sovereignty in our favor to challenge neoliberalism and its terrible effects would come with challenges of its own. However, what I can say is that independence will provide Puerto Rico with more tools to combat its woes, and that it gives us the agency and the toolbox of the nation state to do so. It would also allow us the ability to negotiate our own trade stipulations and organize our economy in more sustainable ways, placing socioeconomic initiatives that we value as a nation and that could possibly work as a bulwark against the existential uh, crisis of our time, the impending climate crisis, front and center. But more than just having the tools at our disposition, independence for Puerto Rico garners many more virtues that are worthy of mention and relevant possibilities that are particular to our nation. Unlike other nations that are independent, Puerto Rico's anomalous history in the 21st century as a colony in an essentially sovereign world allows us to consider other economic political possibilities that were never available to other countries during, the end of, during their independence processes in the 19th to 20th century. For example, where other countries and much of the global south were forced to the Pannonian predicament of entertaining grievances of a landless peasantry or the Marxist agrarian question, Puerto Rico's unique historical development of having emptied its territorial extension of much of its more vulnerable social subjects and exporting them to the U.S. was able to migrate many of the socioeconomic pressures moving into the modern world thought to burden former colonies. Despite the tragedies that these processes represent and continue to represent and the repair that should be afforded to the displaced, Puerto Rico's colonial situation allows for the development of a much more egalitarian outlook socialized among its populace when compared to political and socioeconomic situations that are endured in Latin America. These processes have helped forge a very different class structure than those, than those seen in, in the rest of Latin America. It is of differences in egalitarian societal outlooks, coupled with a lack of extractive institutions developed before U.S. rule under Spanish rule that in turn resulted in the lack of land concentration that we see opportunities and recipes for developing a much more sustainable economy in Latin, uh, than its Latin American counterparts. Other economic recipes, recipes for success may be seen in Puerto Rico's sheer industrial output of medicine and medical technology when compared to the most countries in the world, or in our skilled labor, our educated labor pool, which provides the U.S. and many of its, uh, some of its best engineers, scientists, and teachers. Outside of the purely economic realm, our cause is also emboldened by global upheaval in anti-colonialist thought that has compelled much of the neo-colonies of the world to look for development alternatives by practicing economic solidarity among, among each other. Coupled with this surge in anti-colonial thought, we also see a sleeping giant of a diaspora that has shown its ability and willingness to band together in times of crises to support Puerto Rico, but has yet to show it, uh, us its force and full potential. Never before have there been so many Puerto Ricans living in the U.S., it is also a powerful bargaining chip come time to negotiate reparations for Puerto Rico and our transition to a much more sustainable political economy. But these things will not happen unless Puerto Ricans unite and pressure the U.S. into a decolonization process that is fair, where Congress clearly stipulates what it is willing to give under any given circumstance. In this sense, we cannot see decolonization as an event or merely something that we have to decide on. It is an ongoing dynamic and a political struggle that will require that we all leverage our political positionality here in the U.S., in service of a more sustainable and equitable future, uh, a future, a future one, a future that is not dependent on the pessimistic appreciation that has damned other former colonies to the assumed inevit inevitability of erasure, but rather one that entertains 
new ways of being. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abraham. Um, now we're going to hear from our second speaker, Dr. Harry Funky Rivero. Dr. Funky Rivera is an associate professor of history in the history program and global languages coordinator at Bloomfield College. He served as a research associate at the Center of Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican Studies at Hunter College, City University of New York from 2012 to 2016. He earned a PhD from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, a master's in history from Temple University in military and diplomatic history, and a BA from the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagas. He proudly holds a GED from the Departamento de Instrucción Pública de Puerto Rico. Dr. Frankie Rivera specializes in Puerto Rican, Caribbean, Latino, Latin American, and military history and focuses on the 19th and 20th centuries. His latest book, Soldiers of the Nation, Military Service and Modern Puerto Rico, was published by the University of Nebraska in 2018 and the paperback edition in 2021. His second book, Fighting in, on Two Fronts, The Ordeal of the Puerto Rican Soldier During the Korean War, will be published by Central Press. He served in the US Army Reserve and National Guard for over a decade and currently serves in several academic advocacy and policy boards, such as the National Puerto Rican Agenda. Thank you for being with us here today, Professor Frank Oh, Thank you for uh, having me. <clears throat> so um, I guess that I have the ignoble task of um, try to make uh, the case um, uh, or assess the viability of statehood for the US territory of Puerto Rico. It falls on me because most scholars do not want to be blacklisted for doing so. But I seriously don't care because the world of the scholar is not to please the elite nor to go step, good step falling in line with the latest accepted narrative. So let's start, right? Um, Puerto Rico needs to be the colonizer. I guess we all uh, can agree to this, unless you support the political status quo and continue to argue that the current Commonwealth formula and its many rehashes, such as the Associated Republic and other forms of colonial autonomy are not colonial arrangements. Um, so how to decolonize Puerto Rico or what does the colonization mean? Well, that's where things get difficult. It shouldn't be this difficult. But instead of looking at this issue, merely trying to find a workable political solution, we tend to engage in brickmanship to promote one's own preferred formula, formula that may not be uh, viable nor favored by the majority of the people. We resort to tire cultural arguments, which to be honest, make no sense at all. And that all Puerto Ricans elite and political group have saddled us with Right? So yes, we are the donkeys of the old and current political elites in Puerto Rico. At the same Latin America, say donkey, different jockey every now and then. So independence and statehood are the only real ways to decolonize Puerto Rico. Of the two, if there were a binding referendum in Puerto Rico between the two options, a statehood would win in a landslide, getting perhaps 80% of the votes. And this is, this is the greatest well-known secret about Puerto Rican political inclinations. Uh, even to this day, that is the percentage of Puerto Rican, more or less, residing in Puerto Rico who want to stay associated with the United States in any way, from the, from the current status to associated republic to being a state of the union. So because of this, incom because of this very inconvenient truth, the coalition of Pro status quo, pro independence, and nationalists, they try to discredit the statehood movement and US sovereignty over the island. This is the main reason why pro status quo folks boycott referendums on the status. If you lower the participation, you can challenge the result on that premise. And they do this because they can't win. If you were to follow the East Coast and Chicago press, you may think that Puerto Ricans. Um, in the island were up in arms trying to gain independence and end a so-called brutal American military occupation. Yes, it may seem to you that Puerto Ricans are being bombed as Palestinians in Gaza are. Hey, even Alexander Ocasio-Cortez tweeted the nationalist lie that the flag and anthem of Puerto Rico have been banned under pain of imprisonment. None of it is true. <laughs> 
and it has been demonstrated. I have demonstrated that in Conto article showing the evidence, right? But it continued to be a narrative to incite the base, to rally the base, right? Like they say in Puerto Rico, el corazón del rollo, right? So some pro-independence activists, they tried to paint American sovereignty over Puerto Rico as a military occupation in the process stealing slogan from countries under actual military occupation. And not only this is intellectually lazy and dishonest, it is also immoral in two accounts. First, it is the mockery of people suffering under military occupation throughout, the, throughout planet Earth. Second, it is an insult, an insult to over 100,000 Puerto Rican veterans resided in Puerto Rico. The 18,000 Puerto Rican National Guardsmen and Reservists and the 30,000 Boricua and active service who are in many ways, the backbone of Puerto Rican communities because they are the so-called occupiers, Puerto Ricans, who in case of national emergency and natural disaster are the first, uh, are the first faces that Puerto Rican communities, the community in most need, they get to see because they come from that same, those same communities. So since 1998, for Spanish elites in Puerto Rico, the same elite that kept most of the Puerto Rican living in the most destitute condition and abject poverty have painted anyone who participated in the American institution as petty Yankees, as vendepatrias, those who sold their country to a foreigner. While at the same time, those same elites are, were becoming ever more powerful and richer with the economic reform instituted by the US. In present day, activists have rehashed that elitist and hypocritical narrative in the form of, quote unquote, and the occupation. It is actually sad that many of these young activists don't know the master they serve. They follow that line because it's the last straw man argument, trying to argue that statehood is not possible because Puerto Rico is under military occupation. Some have even compared referendums in Puerto Rico to the one that Putin's army ran in the Russian occupying rush the regions in Ukraine under the watchful eye of Russian soldiers invaded with heavy machine guns and tanks. Something never seen in Puerto Rico because it is not the same. This is shameful. They do this because they know that independence is favored in Puerto Rico by a very abysmally small minority and that the movement's strongest support come from those who belong to the elites. So I'm talking about the oppressors. While Puerto Rico was still under Spain and the same people who continue to be the oppressing elites in present day. That's where most of the support for independence in Puerto Rico comes from. And then you have scholars who forget they should be above all of this, and apply the ethics of the dis disciplines even more rigorously to understanding their own country and people. But instead they become activists and protagonists, mouthpieces for politicians and performers for the white liberal gays media and it's, and it's public. And this is done because this sells. The New York Times loves it. And they will argue, insulting again the Puerto Rican born and raised and living in Puerto Rico, the one who had to live in the colonial status that Puerto Ricans are not well informed of what independence would bring or that Puerto Ricans don't know the perils of statehood. Because lo and behold, the Boricuas who live in Puerto Rico, they don't know how colonized they are. Ironically, this used to be a talking point for right-wing groups supporting the statehood by in the 70s and the 80s. And that's a current trend up among diaspora Rican scholars, activists, and even that's Puerto Rican members of Congress. The people of Puerto Rico are presented as people without recourse, people who need to be rescued. Just like the poster, <clears throat> I'm sorry, of, just like the poster of Uncle Sam coming to the rescue of Cuba and Puerto Rico in 1998, this time the rescuers are a diaspora who imagine the island-based Boricua as damsels in distress and very ignorant of their own condition. So the four way of colonization of 
colonization comes to Puerto Rico from the diaspora. Many are, are well intended. They just have been duped by nationalist propaganda that makes it believe all that I just mentioned. Others have ulterior motive, political goal. And if they have to lie, so be it. I would say never trust a politician and much less never trust a lawyer posing as a historian. Others have planned to use or are using Puerto Rico as a place for their investment and even argue, even though they had never lived in Puerto Rico, that they should be able to vote in Puerto Rico and have a voice because they have property there, because they have property there. Never mind the issue of double representation, a constitutional violation, right? But the nerve to argue that you reside in Pennsylvania, Texas, Florida, Alabama, New York, and you pay taxes and you vote there, right? But you bought a condo in Puerto Rico or a finca, that you should vote there, the place where you vacation, right? And that is also the cultural argument. Puerto Ricans would lose their identity if the island became a state. These are typical scare tactics, not that different from the white Christian nationalism fueling the right of fascism in the United States to the MAGA movement. They're similar, so similar. It is like if all of a sudden Puerto Rican music would be gone, we would stop eating rice and beans and cuchifrito. With, we should thoroughly lower the consumption of rice and beans and cuchifrito because it's killing us with epidemic obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol, and blood pressure. But that's beside the point. Imagine that talking point. The culture of the island is going to disappear or drastically change if Puerto Rico becomes a state. To argue something like that, one has to be completely ignorant of Puerto Rican history, or be dishonest, dishonest, or see both of them. First, if anything, the Puerto Rican diaspora shows again and again that Puerto Rico, uh, that Puerto Rican culture thrives anywhere. Second, the preservation of culture is the job of museums. And dictatorship trying to tell the people what's the accept, what the acceptable cultural norms are. They do this <clears throat> to perpetuate dictatorship. They do this. They try to preserve culture and to tell the people what the acceptable cultural norms are to perpetuate themselves in power. Driving cultures grow organically. So please don't fall for the argument that Puerto Rico are going to lose uh, the culture and that Puerto Rican culture needs to be pre uh, preserved. Puerto Rico is not a museum or a reservation, or neither is an archeological excavation. Puerto Rico is alive. So even though my job was to set the viability of statehood for Puerto Rico, I had to address these fallacies and very flow arguments. But what does Puerto Rico get from state? Well, first of all, it ends the political and legal colonial status. It will gain, Puerto Rico will gain parity in all federal programs. It would immediately help to alleviate poverty and it will incentivize the economy by bringing stability. More importantly, Puerto Rico will win representation in Congress. Two senators, I know, we live in the new Rome. The United States is Rome and we're part of the empire. That's a fact. We don't need to dress it up, right? The, sen the uh, American senators are are basically as important or, or as powerful as Roman senators, right? So we're talking about two senators, five representatives. This is where the laws of the land are made, where the public wealth is allocated. Like we say in Puerto Rico, donde se reparte el bacalao. And Puerto Rico will have a powerful say in this chamber with two senators and more representative than over 20 states of the union. Moreover, Puerto Rico will probably get seven electoral votes. Puerto Rico will be a very important state in Congress and in deciding who becomes the president of the United States. So coming as a state of the union at a moment in which there seems to be an almost unbreakable stalemate between extreme uh, right, uh, extreme right wing politician and moderate and sane people would make Puerto Rico a very powerful state a state that may change the political future of the United States and thus the future of the world. And perhaps even more important, at least for the people in Puerto Rico who are the ones 
who, I would say in Puerto Rico, se chupan el colonialismo, right? Puerto Rican politicians won't be able to continue playing the status game. That is more like a musical chair game, right? And in which left is right and right is left. And when this is done, elected officials will have to govern. They will have to show the platform. It will no longer be my vote is the vote for the statehood, uh, for the status. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Frank Rivera. Now we're going to hear from our third speaker, Dr. Jorge Duani. Dr. Duani is a professor of anthropology and director of the Cuban, Cuban Research Institute at Florida International University in Miami. He previously served as acting dean of the College of Social Sciences and professor of anthropology at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. He also served as chair of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and director of the journal Revista de Ciencias, de Ciencias Sociales at UPR. He earned his PhD in Latin American Studies with a specialization in anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. He also holds an MA in Social Sciences from the University of Chicago and a BA in Psychology from Columbia University. Dr. Duani has published extensively on migration, ethnicity, race, nationalism, and transnationalism in Puerto Rico, the Caribbean, and the United States. Dr. Duani is the author, co-author, editor, or co-editor of 22 books, including Cuba and Puerto Rico, Transdisciplinary Approaches to History, Literature and Culture, published in 2023, uh, Puerto Rico, What Everyone Needs to Know, with a revised and updated edition published this year, and the Puerto Rican na Nation on the Move, Identities of, on the Island and in the United States, published in 2022. Or 2002, apologies. Thank you for being with us here today, Professor Duani. Thank you, Cristalina, and thank you to my other panelists. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that uh, unlike some of the other speakers, I don't uh, take a, a firm stand on the Puerto Rico status issue. I consider myself more of a scholar than an activist, but since, it's a, since this is a panel about uh, the status alternatives, I'll try to do my best to assess the different options and then try to uh, work through uh, what I think would be a, an interesting alternative, which is free association and sovereignty. So to the first uh, question that uh, was posed by, by Cristaline, I, I don't think any of the current status options uh, is uh, viable. Uh, either neither the the current Commonwealth status, and I think uh, in the panel we probably agree that the current status is untenable. Just like uh, the vast majority of the Puerto Rican electorate has expressed in various plebiscites, uh, both on the island and in the in the diaspora, by the way. Uh, and the list of of issues is too long to uh, to cover entirely, but I I just want to perhaps highlight a couple of them. Uh, the, the issue of lack of control over uh, Puerto Rico's destiny, I think, is uh, foremost, especially after uh, the federal government imposed the, the so-called Junta, the Fiscal Control Board, in 2016, which really has uh, put Puerto Rico back in the early 20th century where classical, when classical colonialism uh, was taking place on the so-called Executive Council. Uh, in other words, um, we have actually not developed further in, in any way uh, since uh, 1952, when the Commonwealth status was approved, but actually have gone back to uh, pre-Commonwealth uh, politics. And apparently there's no end, at least not immediately, to, to the junta anytime soon. So the lack of effective representation in the federal government and the absolute power of Congress and the president and other federal officials is something that uh, clearly plagues uh, Puerto Rican life uh, and we we'll continue to do so unless there's a major change in status. The lack of parity in federal funds, funding, particularly for uh, programs like uh, uh, nutritional assistance, uh, Medicare, uh, uh, supplemental social security, and many other uh, programs is another issue that has been continually uh, discussed on the island and elsewhere. And the uh, app continuous application of the Jones Act, the 1920 Jones Act, which makes uh, life uh, more difficult for people on the island by uh, requiring all merchandise to be imported on U by the U.S. Merchant Marine, uh, which is one of the most expensive in the world. So these are some of the issues that I think uh, make Commonwealth uh, 
uh, a very difficult proposition uh, to, to defend. On the other hand, I also want to recognize that compared to the previous status, uh, the colonial status uh, of the first uh, five decades, uh, Commonwealth did represent an expansion, if, if, if clearly limited, of autonomy over local affairs, particularly over taxation, education, culture, language, uh, economic development. Uh, and for a few decades, at least, uh, from the 1940s to the 1970s, perhaps, it seemed to be working. It seemed to be working from an economic perspective, and it provided Puerto Ricans with a, with a higher degree of protection of their citizenship rights, uh, as well as access to many federally funded uh, programs. And so Puerto Rico was considered uh, uh, after World War II to be one of the uh, fastest growing economies in the world, in fact, and also for a short period of time, a showcase of democracy. No, no longer, and again, this is something that we need to discuss to understand the current predicament of Puerto Rico. Now, the argument that um, Puerto Rico would uh, expand its uh, citizenship rights and culminate its uh, uh, century-long process of uh, uh, incorporation into the United States is a compelling one. Uh, I do think that uh, there's much to be said about equal political representation, as has been mentioned before, the fact that Puerto Rico would be fully represented in Congress, uh, unlike now, there's a non-voting com resident commissioner, for example, who has very little power uh, or influence, except perhaps in committee. Um, and there's an argument to be made about the expansion of federally funded uh, programs, especially for the poor. Uh, and I was reminded, for example, of Carlos Romero Barcelos, uh, the former president of the uh, uh, statehood party in Puerto Rico, who argued convincingly, I think, and very compellingly, that statehood is for the poor. On the other hand, on the negative side, uh, the issue of culture has been mentioned, uh, and I think it's uh, something to uh, to be concerned about, uh, particularly the issue of language. Uh, it's unclear to me, and I think to most observers, that Puerto Rico would be able to join the American Union without having a majority, uh, a clear majority of people, uh, not only who voted for state, but also who spoke English. And, and uh, by all accounts, uh, that is a very small minority of the island population today. Uh, even though the island is officially bilingual. And uh, there's no uh, historical precedent for uh, a, a new state to join the Union uh, as a bilingual state, or even uh, as it is now, as a Spanish-speaking state. Uh, the loss of cultural autonomy, I think, is something to uh, to be uh, considered. And uh, if only uh, because some people dis uh, dismiss uh, this issue as banal nationalism, for example, the preservation of sports sovereignty uh, as Puerto Rico has been represented in Olympic sports for, for decades, and that's a very important part of the national pride of Puerto Rican, as well as uh, representation in beauty contests, those are probably going to disappear uh, once Puerto Rico joins the union. Uh, and uh, from an economic perspective also, there has been discussion about what, what exactly would uh, statehood mean in terms of losing the special uh, uh, tax uh, incentives that were so crucial for Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican development for decades, and of course, the uh, payment of federal income taxes. Those are just a few of the issues that have been discussed and continue to be discussed today. Now, the third alternative, independence, of course, would bring about uh, the uh, assertion of sovereignty, the development of international relations and the full representation of Puerto Rico as a nation state, uh, the, the capacity to establish uh, commercial treaties, which it does not have right now, uh, and the full defense and assertion of national identity and language in particular, those I think would be strong points of an independent Puerto Rico, the capacity to establish their own uh, uh, public policies uh, reflecting the interests of the Puerto Rican people and not the uh, debtors uh, or the uh, uh, people who uh, are trying to um, uh, maximize on Puerto Rico's uh, public debt issues. Um, and uh, also, I think there's an opportunity to redefine the colonial ties with the United States and to make them more equal in, uh, in the future. On the negative side, I think, of course, independence would bring about uh, a loss of federal appropriations for the island, particularly those uh, programs for the poor and education, health care. Uh, and so on, except that, of course, some of those benefits are earned, Social Security, veterans' pensions, for example, 
And although this isn't clear um, in some of the status debates uh, in my mind, what would happen to U.S. citizenship after independence? There's been some argument that people <clears throat> would still be able to maintain their status uh, as citizens after independence uh, and transmit it to their children, but that's unclear to me uh, as a non-legal scholar. Uh, clearly, I think independence would bring about the loss of the freedom of movement that Puerto Ricans currently enjoy between the island and the mainland, unless there's a special uh, treaty between the independence, independent Puerto Rican uh, nation and the United States to allow for Puerto Ricans to come in, perhaps for, uh, it's been suggested, for example, for 10 years in a transition period. Um, and uh, of course, uh, Puerto Rico would also lose some of its uh, precarious advantages in terms of financial uh, and market uh, access to the United States. So overall, I think to answer that this first question, I, I feel that the each of the traditional status uh, options has major drawbacks. Uh, the current status, as I mentioned before, is currently is clearly untenable. Statehood is politically and economically interesting, but uh, culturally problematic, uh, particularly on the question of uh, assimilation into the U.S. culture. And independence, while politically and culturally appealing, does not seem to be necessarily uh, viable from an economic perspective, unless, of course, some of the pro-independence economies can develop full-fledged programs to uh, uh, to see exactly what, what would Puerto Rico would look like uh, from an economic perspective after independence. So what I, I'm not left with much, except, of course, the fourth alternative that has been discussed uh, in the last few decades, which is sovereign free association. Again, I am not defending sovereign free association uh, as an advocate or, or as an activist. I think it's something to be considered and worth exploring. The first issue it would be what is free association? Uh, and I found, uh, I think, a, a useful definition in uh, the Puerto Rico Status Act of 2023, HR 8393, uh, which say, uh, states that a, a, a sovereign, a free, free, a sovereign free association with the United States would mean a sovereign government in Puerto Rico, but legally bound to the U.S. through a, a treaty or a pact with full authority or responsibility over its territory and, and population under its own constitution. This is quite similar. Some of, of the, the people in the audience might uh, be familiar with the agreements of free association that the United States had set up with. Uh, three islands in the Pacific, the uh, Micronesia, Marshall Islands, and Palau. I don't have the time to discuss the details of those uh, agreements, but uh, I think that would certainly be beneficial in terms of understanding the experience. There's also a procedure set up in the uh, Puerto Rico Status Act that I think might be interesting uh, to pursue if Puerto Ricans uh, uh, wanted to uh, choose this option. First of all, of course, they would have to draft a uh, constitution. Um, uh, by by electing first a constitutional convention, and then uh, should this uh, uh, convention uh, uh, receive majority approval, uh, they would have the members of that uh, convention would have to negotiate the details of free association between the United States and Puerto Rico in areas such as trade, defense, currency, economic aid, foreign affairs. In fact, everything would be up for um, for negotiation. Then, of course, it would go back to the Puerto Ricans. Uh, to vote on that and then ratified by Congress. And finally, the, the uh, legislation talks about a transition period, probably 10 years in which uh, the current uh, situation uh, would continue to have some sort of uh, special US aid, uh, freedom of movement to the United States, et cetera. So as I see this, I think, uh, again, sort of thinking out loud uh, about the possibilities of this option, I think, I think there are some uh, benefits uh, of the free association uh, option, such as the international recognition of Puerto Rico as a sovereign state, the continuing access of Puerto Ricans to uh, some uh, benefits uh, that they currently have uh, as, uh, as a U.S. Commonwealth. And then on the other hand, the development of foreign policy alternatives, the uh, establishment of diplomatic ties with other countries, which Puerto Rico does not have right now, uh, the international treaties, and renegotiating the relationship between the United States uh, to be more equitable and, uh, and bilateral. Um, and finally, I think uh, it, it, there's a possibility of uh, asserting and preserving language and culture uh, under this, this option. 
I mentioned a couple of the problems already, but I, I want to underline the lack of clarity of the, the term free association. Some people think it's independence. Some people think it's uh, 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 an enhanced form of commonwealth. Some people think it's just a wish list of things that uh, Puerto Ricans want to have at the same time that they have more autonomy, have uh, uh, still a permanent union with the United States. There's clearly a lack of majority support uh, at this time for free association. I think that the last time this, this option was put to the voters uh, separate from independence, less than 1% of people voted for it. I guess, again, uh, presumably in part because of the lack of, of clear definition of the of the option. Um, and, and then, of course, one of the most negative aspects of free association would be the withdrawal of existing federal programs for education, healthcare, housing, transportation, and so on, on which the vast majority of the Puerto Rican people uh, depend. So in, in, in some, I think my assessment of this option would be that it's uh, a, a, an, in, an interesting option to, uh, to assess, uh, despite its limitations uh, and, and problems, as I tried to mention. But clearly, one way of uh, thinking about uh, overcoming the current economic and political crisis on the island. So my final comments have to do with the uh, whether the island status uh, issue uh, is uh, going to determine its fate. I do think that status continues to matter uh, because the island lacks the capacity to govern itself and is subordinate to the United States as a so-called unincorporated territory, that legal doctrine that continues to haunt Puerto Ricans to this day after 125 years. Uh, and in fact, I think the situation has become even worse on the promesa, the uh, Puerto Rico uh, oversight and uh, restructuring program set up by uh, Congress in, in 2016. Um, that would be one, one aspect to consider. A second one is that I think if you look at the landscape, the political landscape in Puerto Rico, there are some interesting changes that go beyond status, but yet are not uh, necessarily more important than that. So uh, I know that the panel will probably uh, uh, agree with me that the, the, there are now uh, more political actors on the island. In fact, uh, two new political entities developed in the last uh, uh, few elections, uh, Victoria Ciudadana and Proyecto Dignidad, which are not focused on status options. They, they have different issues. They're, they're more concentrated on concrete socioeconomic aspects such as the fight for corruption or the economic reconstruction after PROMESA, uh, the issue of climate change, uh, the privatization of the power grid, and other uh, problems that, uh, in my in my way, in my mind, remind remind me of the 1940 uh, slogan of the Popular Democratic Party: uh, "The status is not an issue." Uh, a third issue is that there's now an unofficial alliance between the Puerto Rican Independence Party and the Movimiento de Victoria Ciudadana, which actually uh, may, uh, may be able to overturn the bipartisan uh, party system that, that has uh, prevailed in Puerto Rico for decades. Uh, so for the first time, in fact, uh, it won't be a pro-statehood or a pro-commonwealth uh, uh, governor if the numbers that have been published uh, point in that direction. And currently the, the governor, in fact, uh, yet we see, uh, has, has no more than one third of the votes. Uh, and actually no, um, none of the parties, the two main parties has had a majority of, of the votes for governor for, for several elections. And that's uh, something that's different and perhaps seems to express the willingness of Puerto Ricans to entertain a different kind of politics that moves beyond the status issue that doesn't necessarily avoid it or ignore it, but that clearly tries to uh, uh, look at issues that are multi-sectorial uh, uh, and multi-generational. Feminist, LGBTQ, ecological student movements, et cetera, that were so important during the summer uh, uh, protests against the governor, Governor Jose Yo in 2019, and were able to actually oust him from power. Um, so I think that's that's my my main um, my main the main thrust of my my comments on this. Um, um, unfortunately, I, I'll end on this point. It's up to Congress to initiate a binding process of consultation with the Puerto Rican people about the political status. Uh, 
And that doesn't seem to be something that Congress is uh, really uh, uh, moved to do, particularly because of the Republican Party's uh, opposition to any consideration of Puerto Rico joining the American Union, um, despite the widespread discontent that I started to uh, my comments with, uh, and the, with the current status in Puerto Rico, uh, as well as the lack of consensus about the alternatives. So um, I'll stop there, and I uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Luani. Now we'll hear from our fourth speaker, Dr. Ian Seda Irizarry. Dr. Seda Irizarry is an associate professor and graduate program director at the John Jay College of the City University of New York. His teaching and research interests include economic history, Marxist economic theory, and Puerto Rico's economic depression. Currently, he's working with Areo Quinones on a book covering the period starting with the 1970s and when the first, uh, when the first post-war fiscal crisis hit Puerto Rico till the present, where the island is experiencing a two-decade economic depression. Thank you for being with us here today, Professor Seda Irizarry. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Thank you, Cristalina and Ed, for putting this panel together as part of the NEIU uh, library series, discussion series between the past and the future. And clearly the topic we have at hand is more than appropriate uh, for this project. And also thanks to the history and political science departments for co-sponsoring, to my esteemed colleagues in the panel uh, representing various disciplines. For me, this is very refreshing not to have to engage with other economists. <laughs> Uh, and finally, to those of you watching and listening to us via Zoom who are interested in the current socioeconomic situation uh, of the island. Now, uh, I guess there are some advantages to going last, but I'll try not to use them. So, But I want to start my intervention by making four brief, simple, methodological observations relevant to my presentation uh, and the challenges that I think uh, are facing the island. And those methodological points are number one, clearly that the descriptions of reality, of course, matter a lot, and they will have repercussions in terms of how we understand potential solutions, or at least the roads that have to be traversed in search of those solutions. Number two, discussions pertaining to the status of Puerto Rico have to be framed, I think, in relation to the immense challenges faced by the victims of the socioeconomic catastrophe in the island, a crisis whose death scale and complexity point to the importance of this type of description provided. Number three, the recognition that there are different levels of analysis that are intertwined in this particular uh, historical experience. So for example, when discussing the reality of Puerto Rico, just like uh, my fellow colleagues, we have to emphasize the relationship between the US uh, and Puerto Rico, there's no escape from that. We also have to take into account the global tendencies of capitalism as a socioeconomic system that dominates uh, the world. And the last point uh, in terms of those different dimensions is I think that we have to look at the internal power relationships uh, within the island, which is part of a discussion that, said that is usually not connected to the status uh, problematic of Puerto Rico. And then um, my last fourth methodological point, uh, which for some might be a little bit uh, provocative, is that the crisis, again, and I'm seeing this as a political economist, the crisis of the economic model of Puerto Rico, although connected, I think can be kept distinct in important ways from the crisis of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico uh, as a colonial status. That is to say that the determination of how public resources are obtained and used within the logic of the existing economic model that we have in place is definitely one that can be reproduced even if the colonial status of the island is changed, especially, and again, pointing to my previous point, especially if the grid of internal power relations is not addressed. Now, which are those challenges that the victims of the crisis mean? And here, of course, I'm gonna provide a partial list. I, I hope my fellow colleagues can add to this. Clearly, we have the realities of inequality and poverty, which have been very well documented. We have to attend the current demographic imbalance where currently the island is being depopulated. We have challenges, of course, pertaining to environmental degradation and climate change, global warming. We have problems regarding uh, lack of affordable housing and efficient healthcare. 
We have, of course, problem of, uh, problems of infrastructural decay, which probably right now is best uh, reflected in the discussions about how obsolete the electrical grid in Puerto Rico is and why supposedly privatization has been the way to go to solve this problem. And you can guess that the list can go on and on and on, add to that the experiences of the recent natural disasters, et cetera. Now, I think that we can all agree uh, in this panel that to tackle all of these issues, any society would need both new and old ideas plus resources to materialize those ideas. Uh, also, it seems so that some sort of active planning would be required, given that, for example, the items I mentioned before are in many cases intertwined. And more importantly, because we have the experience both in Puerto Rico and worldwide, that the profit criteria and the market mechanism, especially when markets are unregulated, have shown over and over again that they are incapable of promoting sustainable economic development and welfare for the masses of people. That's a pretty big challenge. Now, in the discipline that I represent, economics, uh, if the market cannot deliver the goods and satisfy needs, we usually look to the state and its administrators, the government, to step in and provide solutions. Now, of course, in the current case of Puerto Rico, and as a first approximation, things are evidently very difficult when we bring in the potential for the government to intervene, given that how constrained its finances are right now. Notice that I'm putting aside issues of corruption and previous experiences without the Junta. But uh, again, the constraint is, of course, right now, the default of the debt and the undemocratic imposition of a fiscal control board in 2016. As you all know, Puerto Rico is in the middle of a neoliberal structural program imposed by an unelected fiscal control board whose purpose, we were told, was to precisely address the finances of a bankrupt government of Puerto Rico so that it could supposedly regain access to credit markets to complement the sources of revenue for government to supposedly solve the problems of the citizens of the island. But after years of after various years of operation, it's clear that the main purpose of the junta is simply to make sure bondholders are paid back, even when it continuously celebrates that it has cut substantial chunks of the debt. This has had repercussions in terms of the distribution of income, both between classes and within classes. In Puerto Rico, debt, of course, became an important aspect of the management of public finances in 2015, when Alejandro Garcia Padilla of the Popular Democratic Party declared that the debt was unpayable. But when you take a more long-term perspective, you can see that the uh, importance of the debt actually starts gaining traction in the late 1960s. Uh, and of course, during the 1970s, when we had the first post-war uh, fiscal crisis, where various studies, both local and abroad, were produced to highlight the limits of the economic model in place. And as a summary, you know, the conclusion was that the model was obsolete. Still, of course, and this is the point I want to emphasize, even without a fiscal control board, when different governments administrations did have a relative autonomy managing the finances of the colony, because there was some relative autonomy regarding government spending and taxation. What we witness are decades of preferential treatment in what has been a bonanza for both local and foreign capital. Later, I'll provide some statistics to support this. And I think it's clear that the use of the budget, analyzing the uses of the budget, has gives us a key to understanding how the state has been used to redistribute income upwards. Now, we also have seen the state use in terms of uh, annual discussions pertaining to labor reform law. And what's interesting to notice is the role that local elites have played in precisely supporting the different uh, labor reform laws, especially since the 1980s, which have basically pursued a strategy of what in economics we call internal devaluation. Basically make the cost for operating capital less costly bringing cheaper labor, provide less benefits. So basically the main attempt is to increase competitivity by uh, starving the working class. So for most of the history of our history in Puerto Rico under US colonialism, I think it's fair to say that gains have been privatized and cost socialized. And that's currently what we see with how the debt uh, issue has been treated uh, by the Junta and before by local governments.
Now, I think that, again, coming back to the topic of the political status of the island and taking into account the uh, list of things, of challenges that I mentioned, plus the other ones that I didn't mention, I think that we can reach a simple realization, which is that in some senses, we have to start from scratch, redo everything, reinvent society, radically transform Puerto Rico. The, need, the things that need to be done and the scale of such project that such projects require, of course, forces us to discuss the class structure of our colonial capitalism. So now, um, in terms of that class structure and the mention I just made of how uh, local elites have been behind, for example, labor reform laws, I think it's important to recognize how the elites and the domestic capitalist class has been organized since the last century in moments of crisis. If you look at, for example, the 1930s, you will see the rise of the coalition uh, in the Association of Industrialists in Puerto Rico. In 2006, you had the combination of the so-called coalition of the private sector representing different institutions of the private sector in Puerto Rico. Afterwards, when there were debates regarding who has to be paid, what is the priority in terms of the repayment of the debt, we had yet another institution, another iteration of those elites, the Bonistas del Patio appealing precisely to the nation state and the fact that they are Puerto Ricans like us, so they are more important and they really care about the welfare of Puerto Ricans. And the last iteration of this, and I hope all of you have followed this, is the announcement of a super PAC. A super PAC under the law is this entity that can gather enormous resources to support in electoral politics a particular candidate and attack other ones. What's really interesting here is uh, the mention of the word capitalist in the jargon of the press release of this super PAC, where they explicitly said that they would support all of the capitalist candidates, implying that there are some non-capitalist candidates. I think that's very interesting and kind of uh, telling in terms of how frantic the search is by the local elites to have real representation in electoral politics during and after the junta goes. Uh, so let me give you an example of the distribution of income so you get a sense of how these things work. So if you look at the annual economic reports to the governor, there's a little table in the statistical appendix, table number 10 or 11, I can't remember, that talks about the income that goes to the different so-called factors of production, labor and capital. Specifically, income based on labor compensation and income based on property. So interest, rent, uh, profits are forms of uh, income based on property. When you look throughout the last decade, or you look since the depression, socioeconomic depression started in 2006, or if you look through the period of the imposition of the junta since 2016, even though the degrees vary, there's clearly a result that points that income based on labor and compensation based on labor has had a negative total growth throughout this period since 2006, while income based on property, again, rents, tax, uh, rents, profits, and interest has increased dramatically. So, for example, income based on uh, compensation to employees is for the period 2006 to 2021. 2021 has been reduced by 8%, whereas income based on property has increased by 75%. So this is to say that even though we're talking about the crisis of Puerto Rico, groups and individuals in Puerto Rico uh, suffered the crisis in different ways. Specifically, certain groups have benefited from the crisis, a crisis that has as a context, of course, the colonial situation within Puerto Rico. And that's why I think it's a very important, maybe working hypothesis to put right there up front on top of the table that many of these groups are not interested in solving the status situation of the island. And I think that part of the evidence of that is not only that they support the political parties, even though the two main political parties which represent different status options. I mean, that is, uh, that is pretty clear. Uh, but by the fact that uh, Professor Jorge Luani was mentioning all of this uh, processes for Puerto Ricans to supposedly decide what they want. Uh, and the fact that all of this is just some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, theater played in front of us in terms of supposedly we're gonna vote and decide how to define our relationship to the US and nothing ever happens. Uh, 
right? There's no binding agreement with the U.S. government in terms of what is going to happen, and the political parties define their stance in terms of the status. And when you actually look at what's constant through time, irrespective of the government administration, it is precisely the support to local elites that are precisely the ones that uh, keep gaining a lot on the basis of the backs of the sufferings of the masses of people, both employed and unemployed. So again, I want to basically, my main point here is that we have to give some sort of class content to the status discussions that we have, because we know that the elites have used the status discussions as a smokescreen to hide the uh, perpetuation of their interests through public policy, through the different uh, uh, political parties that do support different status options. This, of course, is not specific to Puerto Rico. This is simply how capitalism works. You can look at any state, be it sovereign, colonial, there are biases intrinsic into the class structure of those societies. And that's something that we have to realize and take into account when talking out, for example, we Puerto Ricans have to get together and unite and stuff like that. Maybe the word we implies too many people that have fundamental irreconcilable differences, uh, class contradictions, my Marxist friends would say. And that cannot be just simply solved by changing the status of Puerto Rico. So again, I just wanted to complement the fruitful uh, presentations of my uh, colleagues here by claiming that we have to add more ingredients to the discussion. And those ingredients and the uh, description of the, of the situation, I'm going to end with this, uh, I think are important in, for example, evaluating what's happening in the electoral terrain in Puerto Rico where different parties, movements, alliances have stuck together, have developed, they represent both uh, extreme right-wing positions, some factions within other alliances represent extreme left-wing positions, but clearly the usual game of electoral politics is the same thing as deciding the status has been undermined by the crisis. And I think that the administration of the colony has become a center stage uh, topic in electoral politics. And that in part explains the uh, crisis that both the pro-statehood party, the PNP, and the Popular Democratic Party are facing right now in the upcoming elections, whose result will tell us a lot about what's happening right now in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zeta Irizarry. Um, I'd like to thank each of our four panelists for sharing their opening remarks with us. And now we're gonna begin a response round during which each of our panelists will have an opportunity to respond to any points of interest raised by their fellow panelists. We do encourage our speakers to use this time as an opportunity to clarify any points of divergent or convergent interpretations of the issue. And I would also encourage our panelists to use their time to pose questions to each other um, before our Q&A round. And I'll give each of our speakers three to five minutes for this in the order in which they delivered their opening remarks, beginning with Professor Abraham. So I don't think really have much to clarify. I think probably the things that I would clarify would come of, of the Q&A. But I would like to first of all thank uh, my fellow panelists that, you know, that have shared their, their thoughtful insights with me. And I do think that the, um, the issue of actually taking a stance on the on the fate of Puerto Rico, it's going to ultimately come with costs and benefits that we have to weigh in on. And um, I think that our willingness to entertain those in a relatively objective way can help us move beyond the, the hubris of of the, of the shit slinging that often happens in the political realm. And so I appreciate uh, that. Well, that everyone is willing to be. Uh, to entertain the seriousness of this issue outside of the the, the, the typical mudslinging we see uh, every day in Puerto Rico. And to consider, obviously, uh, the important aspects of, of class consciousness that currently permeate uh, the political structure of Puerto Rico and that keep it uh, to some degree or another in this perpetual state of always entertaining the same interests and never considering other futures. Thank you, Professor Abraham. Um, now we'll hear from Professor Frankie Rivera. Um, okay, I guess um, I usually don't address uh, 
anonymous comment because that's like talking to someone in their mom's basement or trolling you know, on Twitter. But let's address this because this is kind of important, right? There's a comment where you be, um, why are you being disingenuous about when a me was support for a statehood? First of all, that's a strong man argument. I never say that. I say that if Puerto Rico was ever to have the option between independence and statehood in a binding referendum, all of us who have been born and raised in Puerto Rico, who lived there, high studied Puerto Rico forever, and who talk to all people from all walks of life, we know the result. We know it. That's a fact. So you can go on pretending, throw all you want. That's fine. I want to mention a couple of things. Um, we talk about Puerto Rico could be viable because the University of Puerto Rico, and let's make sure that we understand this. It is the University of Puerto Rico that creates some of the best engineers and mathematicians and um, biologists and chemists in the world and historians. Ah, but that happens because the University of Puerto Rico offers a type of education that most Americans cannot take, cannot have in the United States because it's subsidized by the Pell Grant. With independence, that is gone. And the University of Puerto Rico is already struggling. So you wouldn't have that. The other thing is like, um, um, yeah, Puerto Rico once was one of the biggest growing economies in the world, but it was due to World War II, military expenditures on infrastructure, converting Puerto Rico into an unsinkable battleship. And on top of that, and that's something that no professional historian has studied until another um, historian, retired person who became an historian, found the 10 years of Puerto Rico's economic military economy. And on top of that, we had the 65,000 Puerto Rican veterans from World War II and the 50,000 Puerto Rican veterans from the Korean War who used the GI Bill to build more than Puerto Rico. That's why that happened. That is not going to happen. Either as an independent country or an associated republic. Those are my remarks. Thank you, Professor Frank Rivera. Now we're gonna hear from Pre Professor Edwani. Yes, and, and I also don't have uh, specific comments on, on my panelists' remarks, but I do have a couple of questions in, in the chat that I want to address. Uh, let me just uh, look them up. Um, there's a question about whether, if Puerto Rico is able to have a free association option, what would stop Texas or Hawaii or California to ask for the same type of option? I think that's a, a hypothetical question that uh, not doesn't have, that's not grounded in reality, given the fact that these are all states already, and uh, they would have to secede in order to renegotiate their relationship to the rest of the union and, and then establish some sort of uh, free association uh, uh, agreement with the federal government. That's not possible, I think, under the current uh, status. Uh, so uh, that's why I mentioned the, the experience of the Pacific territories, which are not states, uh, and, uh, and and I think that would be a, a more likely scenario for for Puerto Rico. Uh, another uh, comment by uh, on the chat is that I stated that the island lacks the capacity to govern itself. I, I should clarify that I mean on the current status. In other words, Puerto Rico does not have the ability to govern itself. It has to, uh, in, in fact, uh, as was mentioned before, even worse now under the junta. But, but since 1952, Puerto Rico has not been uh, entirely self-governing. It, it has always depended on the federal government. There have been several instances in which the federal government, Congress, in particular the Supreme Court, has re have reestablished the fact that it's Congress that has ultimate plenary power over Puerto Rico. That's, that's what I meant. Uh, and uh, I think there was a third one. Don't know if that this is for me, but there's a question about why Congress is not taking meaningful steps to solve the status of Puerto Rico. Well, uh, ironically, Congress has been uh, discussing, debating the status issue in Puerto Rico for decades, since the 1990s, at least. Uh, there have been hearings about this. There have been several proposals that have died in Congress in several committees, uh, the last one being the Puerto Rico status issue that was not approved by the Senate. And I think the main reason uh, is because Puerto Rico uh, would be such a costly uh, uh, 
addition to the union, given the fact that it's a very poor state, that it has a very very high unemployment rate, at least until recently, that it would add to the federal budget. And uh, many people in Congress are, are not willing to entertain, entertain that. Now, the, the, the worst aspect of the Republican rejection of this is that it's supposed to be some sort of socialist plot, right? Along with Washington, D.C., according to some of the Republican leaders who think that uh, because most Puerto Ricans would probably vote for the Democratic Party, they would lose power in Congress and they would also promote uh, liberal candidates. So given those two realities, I think we shouldn't expect, expect, expect Congress to act on, 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 on Puerto Rico or to develop some sort of binding agreement to uh, follow through on, on Congress. Um, I think that's what, what I can see on, on the chat for me, so I'll just stop there. Thank you, Professor Dwani. Now we'll hear from Professor Seda Irizarry. Yeah, I just wanna uh, ask for some clarifications if that's fine, let me check my notes. Uh, so uh, I'll just go by order of presentation. Uh, so I wonder what are Genaro's thoughts on um, what happened in the last election in Puerto Rico? Because you mentioned, uh, and I think I'm quoting you directly, that uh, that they could be seen as a surge of anti-colonial thought. I don't know if you were talking in reference to the electoral results and the rise of the pro-independence party. So I, I would like some clarification on that because it seems that um, one can also make the argument that it's issues of administration, the ones that have actually captured the imagination of people who have moved from the two main parties into the other alternatives. Of course, it can be both things, uh, but I was wondering what's your, what's your take on that, especially given that you're a representative of the Puerto Rican Independence Party. Uh, well, for Harry Franke, uh, I want a clarification, which is that you mentioned that statehood, and I quote, would immediately alleviate uh, poverty. Uh, uh, I don't know if you have a crystal ball in your hands, but you would have to explain how is it that a state like Mississippi or Louisiana suffers from poverty to make such a claim. So I wonder what's your take on that? Or maybe it's a relative, it would be less poor. I don't know if that's what you mean. Uh, and then for Professor Duani, uh, even though I don't have the programs right here or anything like that, but the the different different organizations of the pro-independence movement in Puerto Rico have in fact presented, developed uh, uh, economic scenarios under independence. Uh, why that hasn't been taken seriously, I guess that's a whole topic and issue in itself. Uh, but just to give you an example, in the year 1993, a fellow colleague who just recently passed away, uh, René Marquez Velasco, he wrote a whole book focusing on the resources of Puerto Rico, what would be the sources of credit, how to deal with environmental degradation, how to deal with recycling, chapter after chapter, taking into account the constraints and the resources that we have to present a picture of what at that time, of course, 30 years ago, none of that is right now probably relevant or it needs to be updated, but but those works have been have been done. Uh, and of course they have to be evaluated. It's just that they have not been part of the mainstream discussions, I think, within the island. So those were my four uh, points uh, of clarification and compliment. Professor Abraham, if you'd like to go first. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ian, for those uh, thoughtful questions. So concerning the rise of anti-colonial thought, I was talking more about this in a global sense, right? I do believe that uh, approximations to decoloniality have brought anti-colonial thought front and center, even though they're not the same thing, they're often complementary to an extent to each other. Uh, but more specifically to Puerto Rico, I believe a lot of things are happening, and I, I'm glad you point that out. Um, I do believe that there is definitely an anti-corruption kind of political identity that is developing in Puerto Rico that emanated from this idea that, and it's an idea that's as old as time in Puerto Rico, that Puerto Rico just needs a, a good administrator, right? And it's and a lot of it emanates also from our political culture of subservience being the economic backwater of the, of the Spanish Caribbean. And I think those political cultures of subservience will brought the idea, oh, we just need a good administrator to, to administrate things to move resources around and, and, and develop Puerto Rico. And that in itself 
for better or for worse, which was once an, a, a pro-colonial kind of uh, identity, has now slowly shifted. It, it's it's left the grasp of the political duopoly that controls this idea, and it is now kind of socialized among the populace and is being instrumentalized by groups like the MMSA and the P to uh, say that, well, if you guys really want good administrators, it's not these guys, you know, it's not the PNP, it's not the Popular, it's not the people that have indebted us uh, to kingdom come and have, have really, well, undercut our ability to, to, to sustain an economy. That said, I believe that there's two things that are also happening, right? Um, definitely uh, uh, for young Puerto Ricans, um, there are, there's a growing sentiment of independence. It is still a minority for sure. It is definitely a minority in Puerto Rico. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that, well, um, I mean, there are, you know, legacies of repression and whatnot, but I don't think that's so much so applicable now at this period, right? What we're seeing more is, as you're clearly pointing out, these are class transitions that are happening. The sons and daughters of people that um, benefited at one time or another from the, the Becerro de Oro of the, the 936, the 936 code of the, of, of the, of the Irish code of the, um, which was, Puerto Rico was exempt from for a while, was able to attract a lot of uh, uh, direct investment from pharmaceutical companies. Well, that era and the, the timing out of those PACS incentives ultimately created this new class consciousness where people don't identify with the political entities that benefited from these uh, these economic, these uh, asset-specific economic endeavors, right? Um, and with that, I think that young Puerto Ricans, the sons and daughters of the Benefes and the Populares of this, of this colonial duopoly are now thinking differently. And this isn't necessarily uh, something that is coming from Puerto Rico's most marginalized classes. It, it could be to an extent, you know, you might see some of that. But I think a lot of it was coming from like the, the once middle class in Puerto Rico, the, the people that were once beneficiaries that are no longer beneficiaries because of the neoliberal economic crisis, right? And with that, you have a new diaspora that is, I guess, uh, that still has the open wound of Maria and Irma, that um, depending on where they go on the, on the geography which they choose to go to in, in the United States, they often take up some of the political characteristics of, of where they go to. But uh, by and large, a lot of people still feel upset and angry about the fact that they were, uh, they were never able to develop themselves uh, in, in, in the, the island of the archipelago, that, que lo vio nacer, as they say in, in, in Puerto Rico. And so I think there's, I think it's those three things, right? It's the global aspects. It's also just the, the fact that, well, there's a class um, attribute to be considered about people that are no longer beneficiaries of the, of the status quo. And the fact that, well, these parties have been the good administrators for the longest time, and they're banking off of a political culture that was able to uh, harden into political custom that the, the, the PNPs and the Populares no longer uh, can make claims to. All right. Um, so how would um, what I tried to say is that statehood would um, immediately help to alleviate or ameliorate poverty in Puerto Rico. Why? Because parity in federal programs. And we know that Puerto Rico doesn't have parity, even though the Biden administration has worked tremendously to bring parity as much as they can. Right. Uh, that's one. Also, stability, which is really important. A lot of people who could be um, investing in Puerto Rico are not because of Maria and everything that has happened and whatnot. That, that, that affects investors. That um, um, Also, Puerto Rico having a say in the laws that govern Puerto Rico and how the Commonwealth is divided, how the program, how the new laws apply, right? Having that say. And I'm going to say this, right? We can go from the theoretical part and all that stuff to what is happening. And I know that back in, well, uh, one of these times that um, uh, the Penepes had won, I uh, happened to be at a place where someone who has been considered to be secre uh, um, uh, Secretary of the Treasury in Puerto Rico, and you know, he, he shoot and went up talking and he told me straight to my face, uh, always been for statehood because I want to feel safe. But if we ever become a state, I'm going to lose money. And that person is a, not a multimillionaire in Puerto Rico, a billionaire in Puerto Rico. They know 
that they're going to get taxed the way they're not taxed. And even that person was willing to become a state to feel the safety because they have bought into his foundation had that bought into the United States go away, we're gonna turn into Cuba and they're gonna give me machete and I'm gonna have to cut sugar cane. But that person who knows that the ELA favors him, that he makes more money on the decorum arrangement was willing to pay his federal taxes. And that is money that Puerto Rico is gonna get back with interest. I guess it's my turn if we're following the, the order presentations. Uh, just to respond to Ian Seda's uh, comment about the scenarios, economic scenarios for independence. I agree that there have been several uh, proposals by uh, very serious economists, uh, including René Marquez, I remember, and I actually met uh, Professor Marquez when I was teaching at the University of Puerto Rico. And uh, later, for example, Edwin Isarri has also put out some very interesting ideas. I guess, sort of trying to uh, remember my own experience uh, until I lived in Puerto Rico in 2012 is that there wasn't a clear sense of how Puerto Rico would attract foreign capital or would establish uh, some sort of replacement for Section 936, which of course had disappeared uh, years be before. And in a, in a broader sense, I think the, the idea that I have heard economists, uh, for example, uh, uh, Francisco Catala uh, also has uh, written about this, uh, that you need to reinvent Puerto Rico's economic strategy, right? After 936, after the failure of uh, Operation Bootstrap to continue to fuel growth in Puerto Rico, there really is very little uh, in Puerto Rico other than these uh, uh, exemption tax exemption programs that have been mentioned that don't seem to be uh, enough by, by any means and that are actually probably negative for the average Puerto Rican person. So I think that's that's sort of my my question in general is that, and, and I think Ian is right that perhaps some of the studies, the technical studies are there, but they haven't been published and they haven't been incorporated in the status debate uh, for non-specialists. And therefore I think there's still that lingering doubt by many people in Puerto Rico as to how exactly Puerto Rico would survive economically if it were independent. Okay, thank you, Professor Duani. Um, and for us, Professor Seda Irizarry for asking those questions. Um, now we'll begin a round of questions and answers with the audience. Ed Remus will be moderating our Q&A round. Um, after Ed poses each question, any and all of our speakers should consider themselves invited to jump in and share their thoughts in any order. Um, so Ed, will you please share a question from our audience? Thank you. Crystal, yes, I will now pose a uh, question submitted by the audience, and I'm going to try to give uh, priority to some issues raised by multiple audience members. Um, we have about 15 minutes remaining before our final um, uh, round for Q&A. Um, one issue that's coming up a little bit in the Q&A is the question of the, the playing field for this discussion, this debate within Puerto Rico and within uh, the politics on the island. Um, one one attendee raises the uh, history of Puerto Ricans being oppressed and even killed for supporting independence and um, asks if there's any kind of um, actual blacklist or um, any kind of victimization that takes place today, uh, for example, within Puerto Rico for um, support, for example, statehood. So I'm wondering if the um, panelists could comment when you consider the uh, the how this politics and how this political debate has played out um, over the past decades, when you consider the status of civil liberties uh, on the island and their ex extension or revocation of um, particular individuals or groups or parties um, supporting one or another of these solutions, um, what, what is that climate? And um, is it, uh, uh, how would you characterize the extent to which um, this, this discussion debate is, is playing out in, in a liberal or, or maybe relatively uh, under, under illiberal conditions? Well, I, uh, I, may I start? Yeah. Well, I, I do think that a lot of what we would consider repression now is not analogous to what it was in the 1950s, obviously. A lot of this has to do with the changes, the transformations that Puerto Rico endured 
throughout the greater part of the 125 years under U.S. rule, as the United States basically used Puerto Rico for different reasons, as it became, for example, um, uh, I don't know, a, a hub for um, during the Cold War to, to counterbalance uh, certain political forces that were thought to be consuming the Caribbean, uh, Puerto Rico well, was, was a military outpost. And other times it was a place to simply dump uh, its excess resources. And under each of these particular um, transformations, there were different uh, forms of engaging uh, Puerto Ricans politically. Um, I do believe, and I think a lot of people that um, are of uh, the belief that Puerto Rico should be independence, independent, given that they did suffer at one point or another, the brunt of, well, of repression coming from colonial authorities in consonance uh, with, uh, well, the, the intelligence agencies of the United States, that there is an argument to be made about independence being repressed at a certain point in time uh, by brute force, by, by out and out coercion, or through blacklisting. Um, that is not necessarily a repertoire that is used now, um, at least openly, and it's not, uh, and it was something that was challenged in the courts in the 1980s. And I think that also a lot of that kind of changed over time also because of the fact that Puerto Rico became um, a very important kind of asset in the commercial realm during the 1990s, and it became little by little, you know, military bases started closing as Puerto Rico's uh, was never, you know, as the wall fell and, and the Soviet Union fell. And ultimately, there was just a less of a, of a reason to have um, or to consider Puerto Rico uh, an outpost for military reasons. And because of this and because of the free flow of, free, uh, of Puerto Ricans between the United States and, and Puerto Rico, you have, there's no real need to kind of repress independence. Uh, but we no need uh, we need to look no further than to see what the United States was doing at the points at, at different points in time uh, in a differential manner, and it kind of goes to what I was saying at the beginning. Puerto Rico is not connected to the world in its uh, in its similarities necessarily with Palestine because obviously it's not a similar situation. It's not connected to the similar. It's not connected to uh, other. Um, places that have experienced the brunt of repression from the United States because it was similar. It's precisely because there were different conditions that required different forms of repression at different time periods when Puerto Rico was an asset for different reasons. That's what connects us to the world. And that I believe, and I don't know if there's any um, blacklisting against, against uh, pro-statehooders. Um, I'm sure that there might be claims to it, but by and large, it's, it's something that, um, I can't really speak to. I've never seen it. Um, and this is coming from someone who's, you know, all of the people that came before me, uh, by and large, were either Benepes or Populares. So, and I think it's the same situation that most Puerto Ricans can attest to, given that that's the cultural, political hegemon. Uh, I hope that suffices the answer. Oh, okay, I guess it's my turn. So I made a comment, right? Because, um, as you know, the organizers, they have serious trouble finding someone who would make an analysis of whether or not statehood is viable, right? And it's not because it's not viable, right? It's because in academia, you are blacklisted. And that's kind of like a fact, even if we don't dare accept it. I know it. By the way, a statehood is not my option, but I do this because my job is to analyze, right? So I wanted to say this, in the 1950s, when the gag law is in effect, right? And um, uh, state hooters who were in the National Guard, they started fleeing and joining the Army Reserve because as they were identified as state hooters and not supporters of the Commonwealth, they wouldn't get promoted. I never knew this until I started interviewing veterans for my different projects and they told me about it. Like I had to switch to the Army Reserve because the National Guard was kind of like a wing of the popular democratic party and we will not get promoted for being stakeholders, right? So there has been other types of persecution, right? So <clears throat> I think it's incredibly condescending, right? To suggest that the underserved communities in Puerto Rico from which I come from, 
they don't know the reality that we're so colonized that we're serving a master. That's something that, as a matter of fact, I got to be honest. Um, this is the ultimate type of being condescending, paternalistic, imperialistic, uh, imperialistic, and it's the ultimate colonization. The thing that the people, que se chupan el mame in Puerto Rico, they don't know what they're going through. And this is what a lot of scholars do. They're condescending to the people who lead their reality. They drown their voices. They tell them, you don't know because you are colonized. And that's what I meant by the fourth way of colonization in Puerto Rico. It is the diaspora and it is mostly scholars pushing this idea that Puerto Ricans, they don't know, um, they don't know what they want. So this is how um, I'm going to answer this question. So some other uh, members of the audience are raising questions about the political prospects uh, for for this issue being resolved from the vantage point of the United States and US Congress. And I'm curious if the panelists will want to make any further remarks about US Congress and the conditions under which Congress would accept or encourage or embrace some, some further resolution of the political status question. I would gladly answer, but I feel like I, I spoke a little too much. I'd gladly wait for some other panelists to, to answer first. Go for oh. it. Go for it. Okay. I, well, I think I, I have said enough on the topic as well, so <laughs> I'll defer to my colleagues. Well, uh, oh, thank you. I, I do believe that uh, Congress is notorious for inaction, despite the fact that is a lot of it has to do with the veto powers that the United States uh, Congress has. It's one of the, I think, one of the political entities with most veto powers in the world. It's um, honestly, I think, a, a, a one on one class in understanding how the Congress works is you, it's so easy to get bills stopped. It is so hard to get them passed in Congress, right? So there's that American reality of veto powers that just makes everything hard. And one of the arguments that is are generally used against kind of the, uh, the federal structure of, of organizing. Uh, well, nation states, right? But outside of that very that that American political culture that is governed by its institutions, or that governs its, uh, or that, that that's produced by its political institutions, there's something to be said about Puerto Rico and its changing purpose over time uh, for the United States and how well right now Puerto Rico is in a transitory period where it's uh, less important for certain authorities uh, of yesteryear and more important for others. And given the fact that the structure of capitalism is one that, and particularly American capitalism, where it launders state um, uh, responsibilities to tertiary actors, and this is like part of the cultural impetus of the, the, the economic culture, I guess, of, of Great Britain and its imperial outlook and that the United States eventually took up. Well, it's something that works against, in a lot of senses, the ability for Puerto Rico to change the way it is, because, you know, there's, there's, there's somewhat of a... Um, of a, something that perpetuates itself and the fact that, well, if there are certain actors that are making money off of this, if there are certain, if there are certain equilibrium, I guess, to, to, to speak on economic terms, right, that is not being upset, then there's no reason to touch Puerto Rico. And Congress realizes that. So there's no real incentive, economic incentive to change what's happening in Puerto Rico. And then you have to think about the political incentives. Well, ultimately, Puerto Rico represents, as uh, Dr. Frankie clearly noted, well, this would be uh, definitely, depending on the statehood position, it could be something beneficial if you're on, you know, if you're considered part of one political party over other. But by and large, if you don't add another state to the union, uh, which is generally the the the, um, the trend uh, of of states kind of joining the union, right? One one joins. Uh, a union, and then the other kind of balances it out to make sure that right that, that the political forces in Congress aren't um, are the, the balance of powers and tip so much. Well, there's no real political incentive to bring it into Congress either, and it becomes this wedge issue. One of the many wedge issues that just governs political 
uh, the political atmosphere in the United States where it's just that we're just thrown into the realm of abortion. It matters a few years and then doesn't matter, you know, and at one point or another, we have to pressure Congress to actually um, move. Uh, it could be with our vote. It could be through, through a myriad of actions that a lot of Puerto Ricans are taking. But ultimately, I agree with my colleagues in that the U.S. Uh, congressional inaction is, it's, is the primary problem, right, when it comes to um, Puerto Rico's kind, or one of the primary problems when it comes to Puerto Rico's, uh, ma maintaining Puerto Rico as a colony. Um, the asset-specific reality of what Puerto Rico is undergoing right now is definitely fragile when it comes to who is benefiting from what. And I believe that fragility has to be also uh, leveraged in favor of changing the status quo, um, where the interests that are actually benefiting from that, which are not, uh, which definitely are, there are corporate interests benefiting from it, but they're not the same corporate interests that, you know, governed the pharmaceutical industry some time ago, or they're not the same corporate industries that were just the big sugar conglomerates that like took over land uh, and that were limited by the 500 acre law. These are very different asset specific realities that are much more atomic, much smaller, and to an extent, well, much more fragile. And I believe that that in itself can be leveraged to pressure Congress in that, well, there's not really much of an, econo an, an, an economic incentive to change it, but there might be a political incentive over on, on this side of the, of the pond uh, to, well, to leverage all of the power of the diaspora in service of a more sustainable future. And I hope that answers some questions. So I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Um, and this question was originally posed to Professor Duani, but I'd actually like to invite each of you to answer it. The questioner asks, I would like to inquire about the new political movements that are emerging in Puerto Rico. These movements are not centered around the status of the island, but rather around coalitions with different visions of government, one more progressive and the other more conservative. My question is, how do you think these groups can help resolve the status issue if they're able to gain more political influence? And I guess I would like to just add quickly to that. Um, Professor Seda Irizarry has drawn our attention also to, alongside the status issue, this question of the socioeconomic crisis, socioeconomic conditions on the island after uh, as, as of the late uh, neoliberal era into the present. And so I'm, I'm wondering if each of you could consider a little bit this progressive coalition, this conservative uh, coalition on the island, and how do you see their politics um, uh, uh, playing out in terms of the status question, and then also in terms of uh, socioeconomic issues broadly? Uh, if, I, if I could just address it quickly, I, I think we're in a new terrain. I mean, it's the first time uh, for, for five or six decades where uh, one of the minority parties, the pro-independence party, in coalition with the new movement, the Victoria Ciudadana movement, uh, has a real chance as, at uh, governing the island. Uh, of course, those of you who are following Puerto Rican news know that it's an unofficial alliance because Puerto Rican laws, as they currently stand, prohibit such alliances. So there's some weird things going on in Puerto Rican politics now. You know, they have one candidate for resident commissioner, but they're going to vote for the other. But anyway, just the numbers are quite interesting. And I'm sure that political scientists and others uh, observing the Puerto Rican elections this year are going to have a ball game because if you add up the uh, the votes that the Puerto Rican independence candidate, uh, Dalmao, uh, received last uh, during the last elections, plus the uh, percentage that the uh, uh, new uh, um, Victoria Ciudadana movement got, they really have a good chance of, of defeating both the uh, New Progressive Party and the Popular Democratic Party. And of course, that's what the, the two main parties are worried about. Now, because precisely they are running on a non-status uh, platform, it's difficult to imagine what exactly would happen uh, regarding the status issue. My uh, sense would be that they would actually try not to push for a particular status alternative, even though, of course, the, the Puerto Rican Independence Party has as its platform precisely that. But I want to mention briefly one, one anecdote that I think may, may be relevant is that I recently got a, a, a request from a colleague at the University of Puerto Rico to see if I could write a white paper for the Puerto Rican Independence Party to discuss migration policy. And I think what they were referring to was migration to the island and not to the United States. So that would be Dominican migration and 
other groups like Cuban migration. And then they were asking specifically for policy recommendations. And I think that's actually quite interesting. Unfortunately, I won't be able to write it because I don't have the time in the next uh, two weeks to, to do so. But the fact that they are looking for these kinds of issues, in other words, that's not a non-status uh, question that of course has to do with status because uh, the current uh, status doesn't allow Puerto Rico to have, have its own policies regarding migration, citizenship, naturalization. But I think it's a, it's, it's a new terrain and uh, we really have to look closely at what happens. And first of all, they have to win the elections and then if they do, let's see what happens. Okay, so I want to add some things to that. Um, I think it might be a, a misrepresentation to state that the status is not a fundamental problem addressed by this alliance between the Puerto Rican Independence Party and Movimiento Victoria Ciudadana. Uh, I think the strength of that alliance is precisely the emphasis on getting a process through that actually counts for something, contrary to all these plebiscites and referendums that we have been exposed for uh, a couple of decades now. So in that sense, it's a different way of framing the colonial situation in terms of the importance of an actual process that does take us out of the colonial uh, commonwealth uh, status that we're in right now. In terms of of uh, this crisis of traditional politics, I, this is uh, this is clearly a welcome um, innovation, I guess, that actually has been preceded for, I, I think, three electoral cycles already, where slowly different new parties emerged. Uh, some were dissolved, some became part of new alliances, and all of the contradictions that that implies. But again, I think this is a welcome uh, step for both solving the problems of the victims of the crisis and the uh, definition of the status as one of the dimensions of that crisis. And I just wanted to add something about the discussion pertaining to Congress and statehood and why don't things move and stuff like that. I think you should take a look at the first uh, uh, board of the, of the fiscal control board, the members, the original members of the board and see their background. Because many of the members of that initial board were actually architects of uh, the increases of the debt in the 70s and the 80s. And all of them have backgrounds in the financial sector, working for UBS and Santander, etc. And some of them had direct hand in 2009 in uh, Fortunio's mass firing of thousands of public employees. So I think that we should look at the economics of the constitution of the board, which makes us reach a very, again, provocative conclusion, I think, which is that the sovereignty of what happens in Puerto Rico is not in Congress. Uh, it's in capital, which is behind Congress. I think that's not me going on paranoid mode or something like that. Uh, again, this is kind of an institutional analysis. Uh, we have too many examples of conflict of interest. Mr. Fortunio himself is a great example. Just to give you a particular case, there was a discussion of the elimination of a 3% uh, tax on multinational corporations. Fortunio said that he would intercede and they would provide credits to those corporations. And the law firm that got the contract to do this is called Stepto and Johnson. They got a contract for 20 something million dollars. And it turns out that once Fortunio was out of his a role as a governor, he ended up working for them. We have so many examples of conflict of interest right now. Look at it from the perspective of the privatization of the public utilities. Uh, the firm that's part of a public-private alliance called Genera that will deal with the generation of the electricity is the same one that also sells natural gas to the electrical authority before. So, of course, they are not going to be interested in changing that arrangement of where do the sources of energy come from. Uh, and on and on and on. Puerto Rico is a place where the law doesn't apply. It applies to both the Constitution. Remember the debt under COFINA, $18 billion, extra-constitutional debt. What a term, extra-constitutional, standing in for the word illegal. 
the board is celebrating that they cut 30, I guess, uh, six billion dollars out of that debt. It's not a coincidence that they, when they audited that debt, they did not go over the years in which the members of the junta were actually performing public duties and public service uh, as members of the government of Puerto Rico. Again, these are not coincidences. This has to be uh, slowly investigated and brought up to understand that the problem is one in which we have to talk about the uh, cap capitalist colony that is uh, Puerto Rico. So we cannot just abstract from class relationships uh, within our particular socioeconomic system. So in, in that sense, I also wanna make a comment regarding Genaro because you did, I'm sure you didn't imply it, but I'm not saying that we need better administrators. I think corruption is endemic to the type of, that's how states work in general. There's always corruption. In Puerto Rico, the FBI has intervened to talk about corruption. Former secretaries of, uh, of uh, economics, the same. We uh, the auditing, the process of auditing that debt. A law was passed. Resources were never given. Uh, you know, this is on and on and on and on and on. And again, the scale of the problems that we have require as much as a big scale of solutions, and that again implies a huge transformation of our socioeconomic uh, situation. And Professors Frankie Rivera and Abraham, would, would either of you like to jump in on this question before we move to our closing round? Sure. Well, on the um, issue of political coalitions? Oh, go for it, uh, Dr. Frankie, please. Uh, okay, well, I see this. Um, I'm really excited about these coalitions, right? Um, as we have mentioned, they're not new. They're in the 1920s and 30s, we had all these coalitions formed, even some of them call them holy coalitions of socialists and the owners of the means of production, right? They're on the respective parties and whatnot. We've seen this before and we're seeing something similar. And this all led to Luis Muñoz Marin being kicked out of the party and come up with the idea of the status is, is not the issue. We're gonna fix the economy. We're going to govern better. Give me four years and if I don't, um, uh, let me borrow from you for years, and if I don't deliver, don't hire me again, right? And that led to an era of um, unseen um, progress, uh, economic progress, and uh, the so social restructuration of the island, right? I'm not sure that this is what is going on at the time. I think it's going to be a little bit more like um, the salary is not an issue, and the idea of that we can create a different process uh, beyond what has been working in Congress, right? Um, I don't, I, I don't think that's gonna fly. Like we say, right? All of the state of the union exists because of the will of the people, and the United States exists because of the will of the people. The Commonwealth exists, even though we went to all these referendums and whatnot to get approved, and the Puerto Rican being involved and have a voice in on the on the popularis, um uh, political prayer at the time, right? It exists because of the will of Congress. And that's a huge issue. That's a huge colonial issue, right? So we might come up with ideas and whatnot, but at the end, I mean, Congress has the ultimate power over Puerto Rico under the national law, under the political arrangement. So this coalition, if they're gonna do something separate, it could be even more worthless than a Congress sponsor and um, Biden referendum. Like even if Puerto Rican vote for statehood and it's something that is just island based, right? Or even if they vote for independent, it's going to mean nothing at all because it is not sponsored by a law passed by Congress. And Puerto Rico, as it is right now, the territorial status, it doesn't exist because of the will of the people like all the state of the union. It exists because of the will of Congress with the vote and the acquisition of the Puerto Ricans in the 1950s and the Popular Democratic Party. So if I could briefly comment on uh, the issue of the new political coalitions, I can't really speak to Proyecto Dignidad, um, not that I don't think they're important in explaining right these, these new political fissures that are happening, but because I, I really don't look at them too much, I probably should, and I think we all should take a hard look at them to see what's happening. Um, but I can speak a bit to um, the new left wing uh, 
progressive coalitions that are emerging, uh, more particularly La Alianza. But I think a lot of this is built in part on a lot of the lessons and failures of past uh, independentista and socialista groups, which in making call, uh, politics in a colonial setting and also under you know a situation where there was somewhat of a robust economy for, for about 30 years, as uh, Dr. Udwani uh, clearly underscored, um, is very hard. And the fact that also the social pressures, like this escape valve of being able to uh, to leave to the United States uh, if you can't endure the economic conditions on, in Puerto Rico allowed for basically, well, it didn't allow for the independentista movements to really organize around particular social subjects as the most vulnerable were also always kicked out, you know, uh, via migration patterns and via just not being able to stay on the island um, for economic reasons. And I think that created a situation where independentismo became very ideologically, uh, it kind of parted into it just this more nationalistic ideology. Uh, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is a different story, but it did become very much uh, a less of a class-centered creature. And there were other elements in the independentista movements, we be it the Partido Socialista Puerto Riqueño, be it uh, the MPI, which was a bit like the movement that eventually became the, the Partido Socialista Puerto Riqueño, and eventually uh, the movements, the anti-neoliberal movements that came up in the 1990s, that definitely tried to work um, out of the ruins of uh, what the sheer repression had kind of uh, caused against you know, uh, independence movements in Puerto Rico. Um, they, they eventually started gravitating towards not trying to have the perfect stances about independence and anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, but rather on focusing on the material grievances of people and building politics around them. And I think that's what that's the uh, the beauty, I guess, uh, of the MABC. Not that I agree with the strategy necessarily, but it is certainly uh, a refreshing strategy in that, well, they are building politics out of the material grievances of people and off of ideas that are well socialized among the Puerto Rican populace. The people, on the other hand, I believe, has managed to garner a lot of support because, well, unfortunately, in the dynamics of colonial capitalism, it is a fast-changing evolutionary kind of ecosystem of the way things work, right? And when an asset-specific economy goes under, you know, after a boom and a bust, you have a redefining of social subjectivities that is just not sustainable to build politics around. And with that, well, you have this issue of like just uh, a lot of the left really struggles to make meaningful politics around societal subjects. However, as Ruben Berrios might say, there was somewhat of a, of a carrying of the flame of independentismo that merged with a movement that was looking to work with the societal um, kind of grievances that were heavily socialized among people that united at a perfect moment in history. And we're at that moment right now. And hopefully, these things can be leveraged. Thinking about the different social subjectivities that have to, have to be entertained to understand the complexity of Puerto Rico and the oppression that is that is seen in Puerto Rico under differential circumstances over time, uh, they're coming together at a perfect moment. And hopefully, they'll be leveraged uh, in service of a real decolonization process, not one that is just carried on by a vote, carried out by a vote. Uh, but one that really entertains the myriad of grievances that define, as Jorge Duani would say, the, the nation on the move. So thank you for that. Uh, those closing remarks. I'll go ahead and, and stop talking to leave at least a few minutes for someone else. Well, thank you all. I, I want to thank our speakers for their thoughtful responses, and I want to thank our audience for posing those excellent questions. That's all the time we have for Q&A. So now I'll turn it back over to Crystal. Thanks, Ed. Um, I'll now invite our speakers to just go down the line in their original speaking order to offer closing remarks about one or two minutes each um, and use this time to address the single most significant point that you all believe our discussion has raised. And we'll begin with Professor Abraham. Well, now I'll be brief. Um, just thank you for, for having me. Thank you for allowing me to speak about these issues that I care deeply about. And uh, if you would like, to get more involved. And I see there's some questions in the Q&A about how, like what can Americans do to kind of leverage their positionality in favor of decolonization? Please feel free to reach out. I'm here and I'd love to continue this conversation 
And hopefully, Ian, Frankie, um, uh, Ian, if they had Hari e Jorge, hopefully we can continue this conversation at another moment. Thank you, Professor Abraham. Now we'll hear from Professor Frankie Rivera. Okay, I'm going to use my last minute to address uh, uh, a comment. Um, Apparently, I didn't answer a question. It wasn't my intention. Um, um, why Congress hasn't taken meaningful action to resolve the status issue, like, uh, let alone like Puerto Rico state? It depends on the era. When the United States took control over Puerto Rico, they wanted the territory, they didn't want the people. The old adage is they wanted the cage, but not the birds. And it was based on very racist assumptions of what the Puerto Ricans would. Uh, bring to the United States, like contaminate the fabric of, of Americanness and whatnot, right? And there was also the exploitative nature that if Puerto Rico didn't become a state, Puerto Rico could be exploited more effectively. And that, um, I mean, through the different ages, the US Congress and US economic interests and political interests and the power that be, they have different reasons for keeping Puerto Rico as a column. But in the 1950s, when Puerto Rico, right after World War II, actually in, by 1948, when the United States at the high of its power, right? Basically unrivaled, right? And um, kind of like the self-proclaimed champion of the world, the US military was, uh, they were hearing some creating an elected governor seat for Puerto Rico, right? And Munoz Marin had opposed it to World War II. He came to embrace it only because the US military had come to support statehood. And the US was considering in the mid uh, and late 1940s to make Puerto Rico state as a reward for the contribution to the war. And also they were using that to skirt Munoz Marin from continued talking or siding with independentistas. And that's the moment in which with Munoz Marin kicked the pro-independence factions out and came and fully embraced the Commonwealth, not to stop independence, but to at least put statehood on hold, right? And again, this is a Democrats today, because it's certain, not in the past, they want Puerto Rico to become a state to break this, uh, the political stalemate, to stop the United States from becoming a fascist dictatorship, because that's where we go, right? Uh, so instead, we could go to a light fascist democracy. Um, but the Republicans used to push this, right? They used to push this. So there has been uh, there has been interest, but for the longest time, it was really convenient to keep Puerto Rico as a state. That ended under the Obama administration, which Puerto Rico hadn't been relevant for US plans since the Cold War ended, right? Puerto Rico was no longer, the US, Puerto Ricans kicked out the military out, right? Uh, there's no longer a Cold War. Cuba still being important, Puerto Rico still being important, right? And now we have become like the turn on the side. I think now is the time that we can actually freely decide. And I hope that I did um, answer your question now, Mary Fernandez. Thank you, Professor Franca Rivero. Next, we'll hear from Professor Duani. Yeah, uh, Cristaline mentioned that I have just uh, com completed the second edition of my. Uh, book, Puerto Rico, what everyone needs to know. Uh, and I tried to cover in, in a new chapter uh, much of the stuff that has happened since 2017. And when I started writing that chapter, I realized how much has happened in the last few years. The two hurricanes, the, you know, the economic crisis, uh, earthquakes, the resignation of a Puerto Rican governor, the first one in Puerto Rican history, an elected governor. Um, uh, so many, so many social and economic and natural catastrophes, and yet Puerto Rico is still there. Uh, I, I hesitate to use the word resilience because I know that's been overused, but I do think that the country has changed tremendously in the past few years, and the politics have changed. And I think a couple of other things aside from the coalitions that we've been uh, looking at uh, and discussing is that uh, <clears throat> the voter participation rate, for example, has decreased. Uh, to less than half of all voters in Puerto Rico, which is unheard of. Puerto Rico, compared to other countries, had a very high uh, voter participation rate. And then the number of mixed and independent votes. Um, uh, just recently, last week, I was reading about the 43 independent uh, 
candidates that have filed their their candidacies. Unfortunately, they're not getting the support that they need, so they probably won't be able to run. But this is unheard of. I think the the fact that the the, the terrain now is so um, uh, so new, uh, and the social and political and economic forces are so mobile, the fact that there are now uh, a huge number of grassroots organizations that were uh, mobilized and activated during the last few years is is quite uh, interesting uh, and and challenging. And I think uh, maybe uh, nine months from now we should be uh, meeting again and see what's happened in Puerto Rico in this regard. Thank you, Professor Duani. And lastly, we'll hear from Professor Seda Irizarry. Well, I just want to recognize that, of course, the current situation in Puerto Rico is very fertile uh, in terms of uh, transformative potential. That doesn't mean that the outcome will be good. <laughs> That's something that applies in every instance. But I get to reiterate my position. Solving the colonial situation is a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition for solving the problems of most of the population in the island. And we cannot definitely reduce politics to relationships among nation states. Uh, Puerto Rico, like all nations, is a class society in which there are conflicting interests. And those are things that we have to address. Uh, and we have to give, again, a class content to the status discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, OK, so a video recording of this event will be posted on the NEIU Library's YouTube channel within the next few days. Those of you who would like to reflect further on the ideas that you've heard this evening are encouraged to rewatch the event when it's posted there. Um, before I draw our event to a close, I wanna ask our audience to do two things. First, uh, please fill out the survey that you'll receive via email um, after this event. And then your feedback is fairly important to us. And if you provide your email address, we'll let you know about upcoming events in the series. Secondly, please join me in giving a warm round of virtual applause to our speakers for sharing their ideas with us today. Thank you all for joining us and have a great night.